you know, usually when I talk, when I do talks, I talk about, you know, human rights violations and why it is that we need to stop human rights violations. Why is it that it's in the benefits of these other countries that are helping enable human rights violations in places like Bahrain, why is it important for them to stand against it? But today, that's not really my speech. Today, I want to take you a little further back on a little journey with me. And the journey starts in Syria, where I was born. I was born in Syria in 1987. And when I was a year and a half old, my family decided to move to Denmark and seek political asylum, because both my parents were active. And they were both unable to go back to Bahrain. And they did. And we lived in Denmark for 14 years, after which we decided to go back to Bahrain, first opportunity we were allowed. Now, growing up, my parents taught us that you need to live your life to make sure that you fight injustice. If you see injustice happen, and you don't do anything about it, then you are an enabler of that injustice. Now, when we went back to Bahrain, you know, you, you hear your parents say a lot of stuff, right? And you don't necessarily always listen. And I remember when we went to Bahrain, my father was in and out of prison. And I saw that, you know, my father would go out and there are 20 other protesters, 15 other protesters, they'd get beaten, my father would come with scars on his back. But there would really be no response from the public. And this really angered me and frustrated me because I thought I was going back to a Bahrain where there was a revolution. You know, I was living in Denmark for 14 years thinking of Bahrain as that land of paradise where everyone stands up for their rights. And that wasn't what I found when I went back. And so I was very disenchanted and I used to constantly go to my father and say, I don't understand why you do this. And he used to smile and not really say much. Uh, and he knew that one day I would understand. But in the beginning I was active. And then I went through a period where I stopped caring. I went to university. You know, my biggest worry was what restaurant I was going to go to with my friends that night. I didn't care that these other things were happening, that people were being beaten on the streets, that they were being arrested. Because I disassociated myself from that. I disconnected. Because I could. Now, after what happened, and I don't need to go into too much details because you guys saw the video. It changed my entire perception of what happened in Bahrain. It made me understand why people were the way they were when I went back to Bahrain. You know, people had gone through the 1990s. Bahrain has had an uprising almost every 10 years since the 1920s. And so people just did not want to go back to that. I didn't understand this. I lived in the safety of Denmark. I lived in a country where I could say whatever I want, where I could be whatever I want, and where I could do whatever I want. And so to me, this concept did not make sense to me, that people would be oppressed and not really do anything about it. But I understood. After seeing everything that happened post 14 February 2011, I started to understand why people did not want to go back to that. To not be able to leave your house without thinking, well, there's a possibility I might not come back. To wake up every morning and wonder which member of your family might be arrested that day. To read a report about your father or your brother or your uncle or your sister about how they were severely, psychologically, physically, and sexually tortured. And that's not something that people you know, can easily let go of. It's something that scars you for life. And I think you know, this is one of the things that's frustrated me the most when I started working in human rights. Is I travel the world, and I meet with governments, and I meet with organizations, and I meet with everyone. And their point to me is always, well, they released the political prisoners. That's a good thing. We need to applaud them for that. And I say, do you understand that these political prisoners who were released are scarred for life? Do you thank a rapist for letting go his rape victim after he has raped her? You don't. So why do we thank these governments when they let go of political prisoners after torturing them? It does not make sense to me. Now, I was pushed into the human rights field. And this is one thing that I was actually talking to some of you about today. A lot of activists and human rights defenders are pushed to become who they are these days. These governments and these regimes are creating hundreds of new journalists, hundreds of new activists and human rights defenders. And I think it's beautiful. Because these are people who would have never thought about doing these things. When I went back to Bahrain in 2010 after teaching in the US for a year, I was looking for a job. I didn't want to do human rights. I saw what my father was going through. 
But because of my father's work, I was not allowed to get a job. I had to sit at home. And so I started volunteering. And because I started volunteering, I got threats of arrest. And I had to leave the country. And I actually came here to London. That's how my human rights career started. Now, I went into the human rights uh, field and I thought, well, you know what, you know, at least, at the very least, we have international mechanisms that we can use to protect and defend human rights. Right? Something called the United Nations. Now, then I actually started engaging with the United Nations. And I found out that as a human being, your worth, your complete worth as a human being, is the papers that you carry. The kind of passport that you carry. And unfortunately, if you're Bahraini, if you're Saudi, if you're from the Gulf in general, Palestinian, there are so many other nationalities. Where if you go to the UN, even the Human Rights Council, which is supposed to care about human rights, that's their issue. You don't have any worth. Because it's controlled by politics. And it's controlled by which country can influence the other countries the most. And that, I think, is our current problem. You know, what I see today here in the room is not an audience. I see change agents. And what is a change agent? It's someone who can change this world to, be, to become a better, a better place, right? Why do I say this? It's not because I'm saying this because I think, you know, um, each one of you is going to go out tomorrow and become president or whatnot. No. But because we can affect change in our own ways. There are so many different tools. The way that we choose to live our lives impact everything. And yes, it's easy to live so far away and be completely detached from what happens. Very simple. And I understand it. I've lived it. I've tried it. But to me, one of the things that really worries me is when I came back to Europe after leaving Bahrain, I noticed that there, the problems are not only in the Middle East and North Africa region. I noticed when I traveled to Europe and the United States that there are measures being taken today in these countries in the name of security, in the name of war on terrorism, and they're slowly stripping away some of your rights and freedoms in the name of those things. And people are not really paying attention. You know, when they pass a law saying that a government, an elected free democratic government, as they like to call it, can indefinitely detain you for suspecting that you may be related to something in relation to terrorism. Where has your human rights gone? That's the question, right? Now, one of the things that I think is very important about human rights, why human rights and why not politics? Why not become a politician, go into parliament, maybe become president, change the world, right? Why do, do I choose human rights, not politics? Because human rights is black and white. It's very simple. The government is either doing the right thing or they're not. And you can always differentiate because there are very specific standards and mechanisms. Whereas politics is a gray area. You can either convince the other person with your opinion or you cannot. It doesn't necessarily always mean you're right. It doesn't always necessarily mean they're wrong. But with human rights, there's no question. And that's why I chose human rights. Now the second reason why I think human rights is the way to go is because there is no difference it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your religion is. It doesn't matter what you, how you dress, what you like to do, what you studied, what your color is. It doesn't matter. You're a human being. What matters is that you have rights. As soon as you started to exist in this world, you have rights. And that's what matters. And that's why, even when you disagree with someone, and I'll give you an example. When Bahrain's revolution started, how did they try to end it? They reached a point where they had to either make real reforms or try to completely end the revolution. And so they sent in Saudi and Emirati troops into the country to help the government. You know, in, in Libya, you had foreign forces come in to help the people. In Bahrain, you had foreign forces come in to help the government. But nobody really heard about that, right? Because there was no real international outcry. If anything, Hillary Clinton came out and said, no, 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 they have a sovereign right to invite foreign troops into their country to put down a popular protest, right? But when that happened, there were certain people who came out in Kuwait and supported the entrance of these troops inside Bahrain. 
And they said this is good, and we support this, and these are rioters and terrorists, and we, do, we, do, we think it's good. These troops need to go in and restore order. About a year later, protests started in Kuwait. And it was the very same people, some of them, not all of them, but it was the very same people who had said that about Bahrain a year earlier. And guess what? They had almost the same demand as the people in Bahrain. Now, as a Bahraini, I was angry. I mean, a year ago you were saying Bahrainis should be killed because they made a demand, and today you're demanding the same thing in your country, and you think you have the right to protest. As a human rights defender, I immediately voiced my solidarity with them. I immediately said that what they're doing is right, and I will support them in any way needed. Because what they're doing is asking for something that is rightfully theirs. And that's the difference between fighting for human rights and just in general trying to have solidarity or you know, being involved in politics and so on. It doesn't matter if you agree with the politics of the other person. If he is a victim of human rights violations, you defend them. You stand with them. And so I think, you know, and I'll try to you know, finish with this. I think one of the things that's missing right now in our uprisings that we're seeing is the solidarity across the board. You know, we see people rising up for the same things. Dignity, freedom, rights. And yet we fail to see that kind of link between all of these people to say we're gonna work together. Because you know what? All of these governments and regimes have already done that. They copy each other when it comes to ways of cracking down. They work together. Human rights defenders from behind are not allowed into most countries today. Kuwait, Oman, Egypt, other places. I've been denied uh, entry into Egypt. They're working together. Why aren't we? Why aren't we, the human rights defenders, the human rights activists, the regular people, you know, reaching across and saying, you know what? We're stronger than these governments. How many are they and how many are we? At the end of the day, if we decide to stand up and say no, how much, what can they really do about it? What can they really do about it? You know, when you enter this fight, you know it comes with a price. And that price is sometimes very, very high. You know, I spoke about my family in that video. But what I didn't speak about is the thousands of other families in Bahrain that have been through the same or worse. Families that have lost, lost children because they were shot in the head with tear gas canisters. And yet the world stayed silent. Why? Because Bahrain is an inconvenient revolution. It's too geopolitically and economically um, you know, valuable to places like the United Kingdom and the United States, unfortunately. But you know, I don't want to be too depressing, so I'm going to try to finish on a more positive note. Um, and it is very depressing, right? Because when I visited Morocco about a, a month ago, um, I heard something that made me very upset. When I walked around and I asked people, well, why aren't you guys going out and demanding your rights? The response I always got was, do you want us to end up like Egypt or Syria? Do you want us to end up like these other countries? Look what's happening to them because they did that. Do you want us to do that? Better in evil we know than in evil we don't know. And it hurt me the most because I saw the difference between being afraid and breaking free from that fear. And it's not that your fear ceases to exist because the consequences are still very real. It's the fact that you find a cause that you are willing to do anything for. A cause that you are willing to ignore the existing fear and the fact that the consequences are still very real and continue to do what you do despite it. But the idea that people are willing to live under oppression just so that they don't have to face these consequences, to me, was very hurtful. But to end on that positive note, um, after my father was in prison, and he disappeared for a while and was tortured and so on, my family went to visit him in prison. And it was at a time when everyone was feeling really down and really depressed, and they felt like, you know, things were never going to get better in Bahrain. You know, the Saudi troops were in, the Emirati troops were there, the international community basically didn't care about what was going on. And my father looked at them and said, what's wrong? You all look very sad. And they said, well, you know, the situation is really bad. We thought that we would get at least some international support. We're not receiving any. Basically, people are getting depressed. And my father said, that's where you're wrong. Because the victory of these movements 
isn't changing the government. The victory of these movements isn't the fact that you reach the freedom that you set out for. The victory of this movement was the fact that the people actually took to the streets. The victory of these movements was the fact that people decided to break free from their fear and go out and say, you know what? That is my right and I will demand it, no matter what the price. And we should celebrate. We should celebrate that victory every single day. Thank you.